Okay, let's go ahead and start again. This, this, this little bit right here is going to be a pretty short segment because we're going to come back to a lot of these. But I now want to distinguish, as we go to higher dimensions, what are the different things we can sum over. So let's review briefly. We've summed a function, right, times the little dx's to get us areas. And then we've, um, we've also summed physical pieces in space to get something, and we converted those physical sums, like sums over electric fields, sum over charges, sum over momentum, into a spatial integral that we could then do over a coordinate system, the way we know how to do integrals. We then looked at two out of the three standard line contour path integrals, where we did just the function as a scalar summed over the path, the function projected onto the path, because it was a vector, summed over the path. Um, you could imagine doing a cross product between the function and the path. And where would, might you expect a cross product between a function and a path to happen? What physical situation? Magnetism. Magnetism has cross products. So we might expect in summing, you know, currents and, and cross products of things to have to use that. The one we did not do was the contour integral um, because that is in the complex plane and we're not going to do a whole lot with complex analysis. Um, but it becomes kind of interesting and important because as you get to higher levels of physics, contour integrals have very interesting properties. They're often zero, for instance, which is nice. Now we get to the ones that are really hard for me to draw, but I want to be clear of the differences between them. So the first thing we're going to look at is what happens when we sum a function of x and y over an area. Now, in this segment, I'm not going to do any examples at this point because we're going to come back to these. But what I want you to notice is the pictorial concept. We have some area, a in the plane, and we have some function of x, y that exists. I made a pretty flat function, but you can imagine it being bumpier and smoother and all of that. And what are we really doing? If it's a square area, it's easy to do. But we're going to sum over the area f of x, y times a little d area element, dA. Notice this is not a volume integral. Okay? I'm not necessarily summing little pieces of volume per se. Okay? That's a, 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 I mean, I am solving, I am in a principle summing pieces of volume, but it's not what we mean by a volume integral, which is where you sum a function over the pieces of volume. Now, in the simple Cartesian case I drew of a rectangle, you know, this becomes x1 to x2, y1 to y2, f of x, y, dx, dy. Um, one of the interesting things is you can imagine doing this for the function f of x, y equals 1. If I do this integral for the function f of x, y equals 1, what do I get? So what, what, what's my answer? It's, I get a geometric thing. If I integrate f of x, y equals 1 over some area in the plane, what geometric thing do I get out? <coughs> but what of the rectangle, if it's a rectangle? Well, let's suppose my area was something even weirder. Let's suppose. That's my area I want to sum over. And I'm going to sum over that area the function 1 dA. I get the area. That's the definition of summing little pieces. right? If I sum little pieces of an entire area up over the whole area, I get out the area. So that, that's one sense in which we want to kind of you know, think about this 
differently than summing up pieces of volume. So this is, this is something that will come up a lot. Now, um, we can talk about something similar, and we give it the name the surface integral. And what we really mean by that now is let's pick any surface in space. So now we're going to have a surface defined by f, x, y, z equals a constant. So this gets harder to draw. And so we might have an open surface. Or we might have sitting in space somewhere, say, a closed surface like a cylinder. And now what we want to do is sum up over that whole surface the function f, x, y, z. Oh, wait, a different function, sorry. We'll call this one g, ds. And so the, the area I did before, summing over a little bit of an area, is a kind of a special case of that. That's where our surface is a plane in the xy plane. But here I can take any surface, and now I have the same features that I had with my line integral. I can do the scalar over the surface. Or if you keep in mind that areas can be vectors, right? They have a normal to them. Now, with the open surface, I have to decide which side I want to use. There's a convention. With the closed surface, I can always, it's easier. I can say outside or inside for my normal. Um, but once I've picked a direction for my normal, I can now integrate over my surface some function f that's a vector projected into the surface. And there's lots of notations for this. We also use da. We also use n hat da. And we also use n hat ds. It depends on whether you want to include the vector with the area or make it explicit with an n hat. And again, the basic procedures are just what we did with line integrals, only now we have three variables instead of two. And it's always a little harder to conceptually think of parameterizing a surface than it is a line. But certain surfaces are easy. A cylinder is pretty easy to parameterize. A sphere is pretty easy to parameterize, right? It's a constant radius A and covering all angles. So those are things where cylindrical and spherical coordinates can come in very handy because the surface in those coordinate systems is easy to define because of the symmetry. Make sense? So again, notice this answer will be a scalar. And this answer will also be a scalar, just because of the way it's defined. Because now we're just doing it over the magnitude of the surface. There's no direction involved. And the final one I want to mention and is our catalog of integrals is the volume integral. And here we integrate over some volume. We just take our function at every point in that volume and sum it over the volume. And again, there's going to be a little bit of a parameterization going on that you need to do. And this is the interesting case, of course, where if this equals 1, you just get the volume of the thing you're summing over. And here, notice this is inherently a scalar. Volume has no vector notation. So there's no equivalent of the path integral or the surface integral where I projected. There's just volume integrals. So if f is a vector, my only choice <coughs> is to do the three integrals separately. And, and, and 
it's interesting. One of the things you have to be aware of, there's moments where you're spending time in physics working on the really hard conceptually things. You know, like doing detailed stuff with surface integrals and volume integrals. And then all of a sudden, you get an integral of a vector over a volume. So this might be momentum density, right? Momentum has a vector no direction to it times the volume that the density is in over the density, right, to get the total momentum. Well, you just end up doing three separate ones, one for each component. And a lot of times, people get stuck here. And they're like, oh, how the heck do I do this integral? I, I don't know how to do it. And you forget it's just three simple ones. Yeah. When you say f sub x, is that like the x component? This is the x component of the vector function f, right? Because for f to be a vector function, by definition, that means f is fx of xyz i hat plus f sub y of xyz j hat plus f sub z of xyz k hat. And it's important to understand the difference between what a function is a function of and what the function is. So I can have a function of r right I can have a function of r vector which is a function of x, y, z if I go into components or I can have f itself be a vector and that can be a function of r. I can also have f that's just a function of x but is a vector. Right I could have a function that only depends on x, but has three components, x, y, z. I'm also used to that notation meaning the partial derivative with respect to x, y, z. Oh, yes. That notation can mean that as well, <laughs> but not in this case. 